Good evening for those of you on the East Coast and good afternoon for those of you joining on the West Coast. And thank you all for taking time out of your day today to join us. My name is Brenda Moynihan and I'm the Director of Marketing and Outreach at the Kensington Assisted Living Residence. Today's presentation is Hot Flashes and Warm Brownies, Women's Brain Health, Hormones, Healthy Eating and Happiness. During this presentation, we will learn about hormones and women's brain health, specifically estrogen, plus information on how food can keep us from getting Alzheimer's and additional dementias. We'll also acquire a yummy healing brownie recipe. And before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to give you briefly some information about the Kensington. The Kensington is an enhanced assisted living located in White Plains, New York. We are committed to providing outstanding care every day with the full spectrum of clinical support, including caring for those with Alzheimer's and other dementias. We encourage independence and confidence and focus on making each individual feel important. Our promise is to love and care for your family as we do our own. We're bringing this presentation to you today because we recognize that hormonal shifts that occur with menopause can increase the risk of brain changes associated with Alzheimer's disease. And that adopting a brain healthy diet is a powerful tool in maximizing cognitive health. The speakers today will be addressing these hormonal and food influencers on brain health. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mary Kay Ross, MD. Dr. Ross started her career as a board certified emergency medicine physician, working in numerous trauma centers and teaching medical students and residents. Due to a mold exposure in 2012, Dr. Ross developed life-threatening chronic medical conditions and afterwards chose to become educated in functional medicine. This changed her practice of medicine and her career forever. A few years later, Dr. Ross would team up with Dr. Dale Bredesen. Together they married her clinical expertise with his scientific insert, insight gained from 30 years in his research lab. Their focus was to bring the best chance for restoring cognition to patients suffering from decline. Dr. Ross served as the founding chief medical officer for MPI cognition until 2018. Today, Dr. Ross is the founder and CEO of the Brain Health and Research Institute based in Seattle, Washington. Brain Health and Research Institute has partnered with the Institute for Systems Biology founded by Dr. Leroy Hood. This partnership represents the unique union of science and clinical medicine. They hope that together they can identify and correct drivers of brain disease while making an impact on the global burden of brain illnesses worldwide. Welcome, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much, Brenda. And it's my pleasure to be here. Very excited to um, talk to you about this topic. I wanna to thank the Kensington. And it's my pleasure to be here. And this is one of my favorite topics. Brain health is absolutely what I spend my life doing. And hormones are a huge part of brain health. And so, I've put together a few learning goals that I really hope everybody can take home something that they can utilize and, um, and learn from this. And so first of all, I think every woman alive today worries about hormones, doesn't really understand what they can do to make them safe. And so I really want you to understand the importance of hormones and estrogen in particular, estradiol, and how important it is for overall health and for brain health for females. I'm going to discuss some of the risks and the benefits of hormone therapy or HRT therapy as we call it. And hopefully you'll have a better understanding 
of how you can do this in the future if it's something you decide is right for you, and how to take estrogen safely. I added the last in there because honestly, I can't tell you how important your diet is for helping balance your hormones and for brain health. It's huge. In my practice in Seattle, we have a teaching kitchen. Prior to COVID, we had a chef and also a nutritionist. So to move forward, estrogen, food, and women's brain health. So this topic is monumental, and I think it's so important to understand why. And I think that as time has progressed and illnesses have progressed um, in America, we're really beginning to understand how important this is. Um, we live in a really toxic world. Um, the world's very unkind to humans, and it's very hard for us to stay healthy in the world that we live in. So the example that was given with me with mold, as, as we grow older, we're almost like a vessel and, and we collect things. And some of the things we collect are not very good for us. And so women in particular tend to reach almost a tipping point where they're perimenopausal, which is a crucial stage. It's a very fragile stage. And we get a lot of resilience from our estradiol and our hormones. And when we lose them, we have big problems. Well, now with all of the toxicity in the world, hormonal decline actually occurs earlier. And when you think about it, um, it can be due to toxins, but toxins can be so many different things. And so when you think about when I had children, all of my friends were able to get pregnant. In today's world, getting pregnant is more difficult and there's more infertility. A lot of this is related to hormone disrupting chemicals in the environment, obesogens. It's just, it's becoming a much bigger problem. Neurodegenerative disease is on the uprise as well in women and actually can be related to hormones and toxins. So this I think is really disturbing. I think it's something that's really important to focus on. So Health of America is a publication that Blue Cross and Blue Shield puts out yearly. This year in particular, I think it's got some truly terrifying information. So Health of America this year focused on 2013 to 2017, looking at all of their insureds. And what they were looking at is the rate of Alzheimer's and all dementias. So what I want you to focus on is the graph and in blue is 2013 and orange is 2017. So when you look at the ages, 30 to 44, it's increased 373%. Excuse me. And that has been over the last three years. Look at ages uh, 45, 311%. And then age that we all would probably expect people to have problems, it's a 143% increase. I don't think that this is just a happenstance. I don't think this is just an accident. I think this is really showing us a trend that we better pay attention to. This is more of a woman's disease, so 58% more common in women. And then look over here to the left, the average age of a person living with either form of dementia, 49 years old. I think this is terrifying. And obviously you can just imagine where we'll be at 2050. So this is something we need to pay attention to as humans and also as women. And we need to learn to arm ourselves with all of the things that we can do to protect ourselves. So that brings me to estrogen because, you know, we've heard so many things over the years about estrogen and about the good, the bad, the ugly, the scary parts. And I think we're in a different spot today. So these are the molecular structures of the three estrogens that are prevalent in, that are 
here in humans, really. Men have estrogen as well, but in women. And estradiol is our strongest. And it, is, it plays a huge part in the developing brain uh, in utero. It also gives us all of our secondary sex characteristics. But I don't think we focused enough on what it does for the aging female brain. Estrone is another estrogen. We really don't ever replace estrone. It's not as strong as estradiol, but one of the pathways that it metabolizes through actually is related to toxins and cancer. And, the, and this is the estrogen, actually, interestingly enough, that raises in females and males as we get older, and certainly in women after menopause. Estriol is the weakest estrogen has cancer protective properties, and we do replace with estriol as well. So the elephant in the room, the big estrogen scare. And I think maybe we don't always all as lay people know where this came from, but I'm gonna tell you about it, tell you the story. So it's the Women's Health Initiative uh, or the WHI study that was started in 2002 large study, it looked at women, and they wanted to determine the benefits of HRT therapy. They had uh, considerations that perhaps it was better for cardiovascular health and for strokes. And so they gave this, this study was done with women age 65 and older. So these women had all passed menopause age, and they were what we call naive to estrogen. And what that means is they have gone through menopause, they no longer have hormones, and they're not or on hormone therapy, nor have they been on hormone therapy. And this is actually a really important point. It's important because if you believe that estrogen gives some sort of a protection for cardiovascular disease and health, and then you lose it, Perhaps that's the reason, and I believe it probably is, that women quickly catch up with men after menopause. So we have a protective thing going, and, and we can live longer than men, and then they say that we catch up quickly after menopause. So they gave these women who have not had anything for, who knows, it depends on when they went through menopause, but maybe 15 years, Primpro. So Premarin is actually comes from pregnant mare's urine. It's an equine estrogen. It is not bioidentical to what humans have. Consequently, when they gave it, they had to give a lot more of it. Hormones worked on receptors. And because this was an equine estrogen, it really didn't match the receptors for our estradiol. The pro part is a progestin. Progestins actually are awful medications. I think they are. They're, they have some very severe side effects. And to this day, they're used by OBGYNs. So progestins are not progesterone. So you should never, ever confuse that. Progestins are used in place of progesterone. And this really puts a lot of the problems. Progestins cause vascular constriction. They increase clotting factors. And this study had to be stopped three years early due to poor outcomes, and they were heart attacks and strokes. So since the WHI study, and, and fast forward to where we are today, because there's been a lot of water under the bridge, we don't all feel that estrogen is as dangerous as we previously thought. One of the things that we know that is essential though is the mode of delivery. When they gave the PrimPro to the women in the WHI study, they gave them orally. When you take estrogen orally, it goes through what we call the first pass mechanism and it gets cycled through the hepatobiliary system and floods your tissues with estrogenic effects. So when you give estradiol, it's really important to understand the way you give it will have a lot to do with your outcome. You can get very different results. The other thing is the molecular structure. I think it's so important that we have bioidentical estrogen. We don't need to take the estrogen from a pregnant mare. 
The other thing is age, age matters. So we get better results if we start hormone therapy at menopause or perimenopausal times, actually, than if we were to wait until we're 65 years old. Because at 65, with no hormone therapy, you've established any plaque buildup and problems prior to starting the estrogen. I think thinking about hormone therapy, um, it is something that's really scary for women, and it can be really scary without the knowledge. Um, one of the things that I think makes it tough is that traditional doctors, not because they want to be difficult, but because they're just busy and they're doing their own thing and they read the literature quickly and they don't delve into the details and the devil's in the details. So what happens is, you know, they'll read it and they take it for what they see and it's bad. And, and that's really unfortunate because um, it's really important for women and it's really important for our health. So when you think about your personal risk, and I'm gonna scooch over to the concerns before I go through the benefits. So what if you're somebody with the BRCA gene? Does that negate your opportunity uh, to be covered? by hormones? And the answer is no. Um, so the BRCA gene, there's a BRCA1 and BRCA2, and these people have a hereditary increased risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And pretty significant to the point, I think it was Angelie Jolene, or I may have said her name wrong, but anyhow, the actress um, had, a, um, had her ovaries removed, so ovarectomy, and then she also had a bilateral mastectomy a few years later. During the time when a woman has her ovaries removed, she goes into immediate menopause. It's a nightmare. And it's also very dangerous for her. So you can actually take um, hormone therapy after having an ovarectomy if you've had, um, if you have the BRCA gene and be safe for three and a half years to five and a half years. After that, they actually do estrogen only therapy as long as, as you've had everything removed and they find that it does not increase the breast cancer risk. And, and this is something certainly if anybody's listening that has this problem, you can talk with your physician about and do the research. But I would say we're in a different time these days and we are putting a bigger emphasis on what estrogen can do for our health and for our brain. The delivery method is important. It needs to be transdermal through the skin, and there's many ways to achieve this. Increased risk for blood clots in patients, we need to look at that and think about it as well. And I wanna talk about the benefits because they're great. So it aids in, if you're having hot flashes, night sweats, decreased libido, you can't sleep, vaginal dryness, you're miserable. It's going to help. It's going to be your best thing in the world. Um, for brain health, so oftentimes menopausal people feel as if they have um, brain fog, and this helps immensely with that. And the reason is estradiol has many receptors that really supports cognition. It's with bone health, I have had many patients that have come to me that have osteoporosis or osteopenia, and it completely reverses with some resistance training and hormone therapy. We know that it helps with strokes, and we still think that there could be some cardiovascular health as well. So again, the benefits, bone health, cardiovascular health, and brain health. It's gonna strengthen your bones. This is a, a diagram that I think is important to look at. The brain is full of mitochondria. Mitochondria are little powerhouses in the cells and they're, they make the energy, the ATP. If you look on the far left, this is premenopause. Um, it's balanced, things are balanced. Energy is up, the mitochondria is functioning well. Because our brain requires so much energy, it really relies on the health of the mitochondria. If you look at the middle, that's considered the critical period, and that is the perimenopausal period. Once you've reached menopause, suddenly you have lots of oxidative damage 
to your cells and your mitochondria are in trouble. And this is really when we see cognitive problems sneak in. Some of the other actions that estradiol has on the brain, these are three cells, microglial cells. These are cells that normally clean house, keep the brain clean. They get rid of intracellular debris, turning things over. Um, we call this autophagy. And when, when you have no estradiol, the free radicals go up. The inflammatory chemicals called cytokines go up and inflammation happens all over the brain. And this too leads to neurodegenerative changes. Neurons actually do well. They, they make neurotransmitters, neurotropic hormones that support the brain when estrogen is present. When estrogen is not present, this too declines. Astrocytes make growth factors. BDNF is made, brain-derived neurotropic factor. And all of this declines with estrogen decline. So I think it's really important also to understand one other thing that wasn't on that slide is estrogen decreases beta amyloid in the brain of anybody's brain and in Alzheimer's patients. So it, it really is an essential hormone and it plays a big role. It needs to be applied topically to the skin, not taken orally. It should be given with progesterone. Progesterone and estrogen are like the yin and the yang of each other and progesterone really potentiates estrogen. And micronized progesterone, not progestin, as in the PrimPro. There are many different concoctions and blends that can be made for you. Biased, bi, meaning two estrogens, has estradiol and estriol. And it can be in different blends, and it's usually in cream form, or it can be in a gel, depending on what's absorbed better for you. Estradiol comes in a patch as well. I use this for a lot of my patients. And actually this can be made by Big Pharma. So don't be afraid and think that Big Pharma means bad. It doesn't. It's all about being bioidentical, which simply means matching the molecular structure of estradiol. It can also be placed in pellets, um, and that is a surgical procedure. I've given you some of these references in case you would like to read. You can um, review that further. I'll make my slides available. And I have a patient who's going to give you her story. So I'm Dr. Mary Kay Ross, and I'm here with a patient of mine, Kimberly Fox. Kim has been a patient of mine for many years, and she's going to give her story today about her experience with hormone therapy and really more of a youthful anti-aging approach to medicine. Hi, um, I'm Kimberly, I'm 63 years old. Um, I'm a mother of three and a grandmother of two. And I began um, my hormone therapy journey with Dr. Ross in 2007 after being um, kind of discouraged from conventional uh, doctors or OBG was so complicated, but I had read a lot about it, determined that I was going to find someone who would help me with that. Um, I wanted to do it for um, natural reasons and also for anti-aging reasons and just to um, promote longevity in um, any way that I could. So since that time, not only has the hormone therapy been a factor, but also the supplementation um, that I've developed over the years and fine-tuned um, with Dr. Ross uh, has really helped me, I think, uh, with cognitive uh, skills, with focus. Um, I have a business that I'm still very active in. Um, I'm a mentor to a lot of uh, associates in my firm. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of them are women who are now um, entering that time where they have questions about it. So I'm able to sort of point them in the direction of where they need to go. Um, I had one high school friend who called me and said, I'm so excited. I took some progesterone and I can sleep for the first time in years. And I said, well, where are you getting all this stuff? And she said, on the internet. I said, um, 
no, I want you to go see somebody that um, can take your levels and, you know, monitor them and really give you um, the most detailed analysis that they can of what you should be doing and what you should not be doing because too much might be detrimental to you. So overall, I've been very fascinated with um, the supplementation end of it also and how all of these things kind of go together and are promoting now, you know, brain health, which is of interest to me too as I um, get older. Um, so I'm very happy with where I'm at. Um, I feel very good. I feel like my energy is great. Um, my focus is great. I feel as sharp as I ever did. Um, and I don't really feel the decline or maybe some of the issues that other people are experiencing. That's wonderful, Kim. Well, good. That's great. Thank you very much. And I'm you're so welcome. glad that you're doing so well. Thank you very much. I um, give great thanks to you for that because it's been many years of um, getting to this point, but whatever it is, it's working. So thank you. Thank you. It does appear to be working. You look great. Thank you so much. Okay. So, okay. So that's Kimberly's story. And um, I just want to give you some parting thoughts. I am going to put together a handout and Brenda will be able to mail it to you, just giving you tips. Know your genetics. If you have an APOE4 genotype that gives you higher risk for Alzheimer's, family history of Alzheimer's, that's important to know as well because estradiol is very important. Make sure that you're prescribed bioidentical transdermal estrogen. Take micronized progesterone with your estrogen. This can be compounded or it can be through Big Pharma. If it is, it can be taken orally and it will really help you sleep. Know your risk and save your brain. It's been a pleasure giving this lecture today and uh, I hope that you have found it beneficial. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ross, and thank your client, Kimberly. And now for our next speaker, Annie Fenn, MD. Dr. Fenn is a board certified obstetrician gynecologist specializing in menopausal health. After practicing medicine for more than 20 years, she realized that helping people change what they eat was more important and effective at improving health than prescribing pills or procedures. She traded her stethoscope for an apron and went back to school to study culinary arts in Mexico, Italy, and the Culinary Institute of America. In 2015, Dr. Fenn founded the Brain Health Kitchen, an evidence-based online resource about how and what to eat to resist cognitive decline. Dr. Fenn then founded the Brain Health Kitchen Cooking School, the only cooking school of its kind focused specifically on fending off Alzheimer's and other dementias. Students learn which foods are most neuroprotective which ones accelerate cognitive decline, and how to prepare foods using brain-friendly cooking techniques. Dr. Fenn serves on the Science Advisory Board for actor Seth Rogen and his wife Lauren's Hilarity for Charity, where she also creates content geared towards helping caregivers eat for brain health. She partners with Maria Shriver and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement to host events to fund grants for female-specific dementia research. She also serves on the Scientific Advisory Council for the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Fenn. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you for that introduction. And hello, everybody out there. Um, thank you so much, Kensington, for hosting me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So, Hot flashes and warm brownies. I love this topic, which I think, uh, I think Brenda, you're the one that came up with this. Um, what I wanna share with you today is, is really a strategy, whether you're in the thick of going through menopause, whether um, like me, you, menopause is a few years behind you already, or if you're mostly just concerned with long-term brain health and preventing cognitive decline, the age-related type of decline associated with Alzheimer's and other dementias, I wanted to put together a strategy involving food and some lifestyle factors 
um, that you can use to really get through this menopausal transition smoothly and keep your brain healthy, both so you feel well now and also for decades to come. And I did promise you brownies, and so we'll be talking about how to make these tahini swirl brownies um, towards the end. So my strategy, I've got six things I'd like to cover. First is how to stabilize your blood sugar. Second, how to avoid inflammatory foods. There's such a direct correlation now between inflammatory foods and how you feel in terms of your brain health and also your mental health. Um, boosting omega-3s. We probably all heard about omega-3 fatty acids and I'll talk to you a little bit about why those are so important for brain health. Boosting flavanols. This might be something new to you, but it's, it's science that's just coming out about choosing certain foods for brain health. I wanna to touch on optimizing sleep because I know from practicing menopause and helping thousands of women go through it, that sleep is one of the biggest issues that you face and one of the biggest challenges to kind of correct once it's, it's gone awry. So we'll talk about some things you can do for that and also about eating during the day as opposed to um, eating at night and how that might be able to help you in other ways. And along the way, uh, I warn you, my presentation might make you a little bit hungry, especially those of you on the East Coast. I'm working on a cookbook, and so I'm showing you some of the dishes I'm working on um, that are all brain healthy neuroprotective foods. So I'll, I'll slide those in there as well. So why does eating to stabilize your blood sugar help you at menopause? So what's happening when you're going through menopause is your estrogen levels are going up and down and up and down on an irregular basis. Um, you know, most women start to know by the time they're in their 30s and 40s what to expect from their cycles. And then when you start the perimenopausal transition, and this can happen anywhere starting in your mid 30s to early 40s, um, every month becomes a little bit different. Your estrogen goes from very high highs to very low lows. Every month can be slightly different. And what happens when your hormones fluctuate like this, especially unpredictably, is it can affect your mood, it can affect your energy, it can give you fatigue, it can give you night sweats, it can give you brain fog, it can really disrupt your sleep and your overall feeling in general. And a lot of this is what has to do with how estrogen uh, triggers the blood sugar um, and how glucose gets monitored in the brain. So what we know now from recent research is that a drop in estrogen level actually triggers your brain to, to not absorb glucose as well. And glucose is basically the fuel your brain needs for energy. So those dips in energy that you might feel throughout the day, a lot of those are related to your blood glucose and they're triggered by drops in estrogen. So one thing you can do to combat this, in addition to maybe taking estrogen or not, sometimes when you're still perimenopausal, it's not really appropriate to take estrogen yet because your body's still making quite a bit of it. Um, but you can combat that with the foods. And what I want you to do is to make sure you're eating enough protein rich and fiber rich foods, because these are the foods that will slow down um, the spiking of, in, of blood sugar and insulin in your bloodstream. Not only will it make you feel better, but also will reduce your long-term risk of developing Alzheimer's later. Um, so these foods are vegetables, you know, especially the cruciferous ones. Choose vegetables that are colorful. Use a choose a wide variety of different vegetables in your diet. Don't always reach for the same ones because they all have different phytonutrients that your brain can benefit from. Choose low glycemic fruits. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term low glycemic index, but these are basically the foods that are less likely to spike blood sugar, either because they're inherently low in sugar or they also have a lot of fiber. Berries are a great example. Berries are sweet and that's why everyone loves them so much, but they also come in this high fiber matrix. So they don't hit your bloodstream, say like a banana would or a mango or a pineapple, which are higher glycemic fruits. So choose low glycemic fruits, choose complex carbohydrates like beans and legumes, whole grains, sweet potatoes are good choices and nuts and seeds. What I want you to avoid is foods that are full of simple sugars and refined carbohydrates. And it's difficult because sometimes when you're not feeling well, you're not sleeping well. These are the foods that our bodies want. These are the foods that we're craving. Um, but if you start your day with something like a chocolate croissant, instead of say this, um, this, protein, this protein breakfast bowl with smoked salmon and eggs and potatoes and greens, um, then your blood sugar is gonna be spiking 
up and down throughout the day and wreaking havoc on how you feel. So avoid sugary drinks, avoid things like soda pop or those coffee drinks that come with sugar syrups or you know cream on top, you know what I'm talking about. Um, not only are sugary drinks associated with an increased risk of dementia, they are also increased uh, associated with an increased risk of stroke. So if you like sugar in your coffee, try to wean yourself off of that and try to drink it black. Um, be cautious, take caution with alcohol. A lot of alcoholic drinks have a lot of sugar and can really wreak havoc as well. I want you to avoid inflammatory foods. And there's a lot of new research about how inflammation actually impacts mental health. And by mental health, I'm talking about anxiety and depression. And now nutritional psychiatrists are now using um, food as a way to treat people with anxiety and depression. Um, they think, they're thinking now of depression and anxiety as, as, as the marker of an inflamed brain. And inflammation can come from many sources, but it does come from our foods. And some foods harbor more inflammation than others. These are inflammatory molecules that are either inherent in the food or they become that way based on the way we prepare them. So this list is a really handy one um, to, for you to, to limit during your menopausal transition. It's also the, the list of foods that have been proven to um, prevent Alzheimer's disease if you cut back on them. Um, so these, these are really important to avoid. Number one is fried and fast food. We're not saying you should never ever have this again, um, but less than one serving a week is recommended. Red meat, no more than four servings a week, and a serving size is three ounces, which is no more than a, a deck of cards. And some meats are better than others. Look for grass-fed meats. They're less likely to have inflammatory components in the meat um, because the animals are fed grass rather than um, feed that is probably um, you know, not very good for the animals either. Pastries and sweets, limit them to less than five a week. Uh, limit foods that are high in saturated fat. Sat there's a direct relation between the saturated fat in your diet and the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease later. That's why the Alzheimer's prevention diet is actually really low in saturated fat, less than 5%. But it's actually high in mono and polyunsaturated fats, which come from avocados or olive oil and some other things. So it's very satiating, just low in saturated fat. So limit your butter intake, limit your cheese intake. In my cooking school, we use lots of nut-based cheeses and milks. Um, I use olive oil instead of butter when I'm baking and things of that sort. Um, and cutting out inflammatory oils is incredibly important. And I have a handout for you that's a guideline to cooking oils that will give you all the information you need to avoid the oils that are bad for your brain and reach for the ones that are better. Now, omega-3 fatty acids. Everyone's probably heard of these. There are three types of omega-3s. There's ALA, which comes from plant sources like nuts and seeds and vegetable oils. And there's DHA, EPA, which primarily come from fish and seafood and some plants like edible seaweeds or um, nori as an example. So omega-3 fatty acids are crucial for brain health, especially DHA. And this is important whether you're perimenopausal or you are you know, in your 70s or 80s. And the reason is that we used to think that our brain cells didn't really turn over very much, like that you were born with all the brain cells you'll have, but it's really not true. Now we know that there's a something called neuroplasticity, which means our brain cells are constantly being repaired and they're constantly building new cells, even into your 70th, 80th decades of life. So you need DHA. It's basically what a brain cell needs to be built properly in order to incorporate it into the membrane and also protect it from oxidative stress. So the best way to get DHA and EPA is through eating one seafood meal a week. Just one meal a week will give you plenty of DHA and EPA um, to prevent Alzheimer's disease. When they do studies on people that have low levels of these, these omega-3s in the blood, they found that they're at 70% increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, which is remarkable. But you don't need to eat a lot of fish, just one, or one serving a week more if you want to, to get what you need. And some people don't eat fish or seafood at all, right? Um, you may be vegan, you may be vegetarian, you may not um, enjoy eating any animal products at all. In that case, you can supplement, but you know we still don't know a lot about the effect of omega-3 supplements on the brain. Um, I still would do it. I think that the studies overall have been disappointing in large groups of people, that taking an omega-3 has the same impact as eating fish or seafood that has DHA in it. 
Um, however, I would still do it and I would reach for a, a plant-based source like from algae. Um, algae actually synthesizes DHA. That's where a lot of the fish get it. So look for an algal-based algal uh, DHA supplement if you're vegan or vegetarian. The next, the next category of foods are the flavanol-rich foods. And maybe you've heard of these, maybe not. Um, this comes from a paper from the journal Neurology that, was, that came out in April of this year. And our journal articles are getting a lot more colorful. As you can see, this cartoon comes directly from the paper. Basically what the study did, it was very, very elegant and important. They took 921 people who did not have dementia. Now, 75% of these participants were female. So this is a great study to look at, you know, the female aging brain. And they looked at what they ate on a regular basis with detailed dietary assessment. And they also did neurological testing on them on an annual basis for six years. Um, and what they found was that the more flavanol-rich foods people ate, the lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease six years later. But it, was, it wasn't just a small difference. It was as high as 50%, especially for some of the flavanol food groups. So flavanols are the, the compounds in plants and fruits that you know, are termed like healthy. It's what makes food good for you. Um, but researchers are now starting to hone in on exactly what those are. So these flavanols are rich in foods like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbages, kale, leafy greens are incredibly important food categories. You should get at least one serving of leafy greens every day. Um, tea are rich in flavanols, especially black tea and green tea. And study participants who had the greatest amount of Alzheimer's risk reduction, they actually drank the most tea, which is interesting. Red wine has it, apples have it, pears have it, olive oil has some of these flavanols. Um, really important for brain health now, important for brain health later in life. Sleep. I know this is a problem for so many people, and I went through this as well when I was uh, going through menopause. But one of the important things you can do from a dietary perspective is set, set a caffeine curfew for yourself. We all are genetically programmed uh, to either metabolize caffeine very quickly or very slowly. And caffeine, as you probably know, has a half-life of about 12 hours. So if you have a caffeinated beverage at noon, it's still in your system you know, when you go to bed. So you probably have an idea whether or not you're a fast metabolizer or not. Um, set a caffeine curfew. For me, that's about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. If I drink coffee off after that, it will definitely disrupt my sleep. Number two, no wine after nine. Uh, this rhymes, but I actually should probably change this to uh, no wine after six. If, you, if you're going through menopause, you might be noticing that you've become very sensitive to alcohol and that even just one or two drink can totally wreck your sleep. And the reason is, it's again that estrogen effect on glucose in the brain and the way you uptake glucose. And it does interrupt your sleep. It, it interrupts your REM sleep and it also interrupts your deep sleep, both of which are incredibly important for long-term and short-term brain health. So you may want to avoid alcohol if you're finding you more sensitive or don't drink it at all in the evening. You know, maybe one small glass of wine with dinner, always with food. Um, and then after that, abstain. It's probably the best thing you can do for your sleep. Some people take magnesium to help them fall asleep. Magnesium supplements are fine and they're, they're generally safe. They're basically muscle relaxants. And so if you're the kind of person who goes to bed and your, your brain is just going and going and going and you just really can't turn off those thoughts, magnesium can be helpful because it's a muscle relaxant that just basically you know, makes your body completely relaxed. So magnesium supplements are safe. Um, they can cause loose stools because they do actually relax the intestinal tract as well. Um, hydration is very important. When it comes to sleep though, I want you to make sure that you're not hydrating so much that you have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And I saw this with my patients a lot. You know, a lot of people forget to drink water and then towards the end of the day, they're drinking more and more water. Um, you can't really catch up at night because if you're up at night, it can be really hard to get back to sleep. So really, you know, set yourself up for good night's sleep by hydrating early and frequently during the day after dinner, not so much. Um, there's evidence that diet high in fiber and low in sugar has a great impact on your REM sleep. That's the rapid eye movement sleep. Um, the sleep is so important for brain health. The studies are just phenomenal. Um, like Dr. Ross touched on, there's something called autophagy where your brain goes into cleanup mode at night. 
And you have to get a certain amount of deep sleep and REM sleep for it to clean up a lot of the toxins that are circulating. And basically what the brain does is it washes it out through the cerebral spinal fluid at night. But the thing is, you, you, can't, you don't get this cleanup mode if, you, if you're not getting the right types of deep sleep. And this becomes really important for Alzheimer's prevention because one of those toxins that get washed, gets washed out at night is amyloid protein. This is the protein that accumulates in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. It's thought to be one of the causes or the result of the disease. The last thing I want to touch on was melatonin. Some people take that as a sleep aid. Um, I would take it every day. It, it doesn't really work that way. Um, I would only use it to reset my, my sleep schedule if I was traveling across time zones. And then sleeping pills too. I want you to be really um, you know, careful with sleeping pills. It's, you know, perimenopause is just not a good time to get hooked on sleeping pills and, it's, and they are very, very addictive. They're okay for short-term use, but not long-term use. So definitely work with your doctor about that. And most doctors now will recommend all the other things you can do for sleep hygiene um, to set yourself up for a good night's sleep before relying on sleeping pills. The last thing I wanted to touch on was eating during the day. You might have heard about intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a way to just reduce the number of hours that you consume food and beverages during the day. And there's some particular advantages for perimenopausal women um, if this works for you, it's certainly not for everyone. But one of the things that's really difficult in the perimenopause is this weight gain, right? Um, people can be doing absolutely nothing different with their diet and their exercise habits and still continue to gain weight. And a lot of this has to do with your metabolism um, slowing down slightly. It also has to do with that estrogen glucose effect on the brain. Whatever it is, it's really annoying and difficult for people. So one way to combat that is to make a, have a shorter eating window during the day. This also allows your brain to go into cleanup mode at night which en enables a better night's sleep and reduces your risk of Alzheimer's disease later in life. Now I wanted to show you this one slide from a study that came out um, actually this summer from the Lancet Commission. You know, people think that Alzheimer's disease is just one of these things that you get when you get older. And that's really not the current thinking. The current thinking is that Alzheimer's starts in your brain 20 to 30 years before the first symptom. So midlife is an extremely important time to reduce Alzheimer's risk factors. And the Lancet Commission, which is um, out of the UK, it's, it's a group of uh, Alzheimer's experts who, who got together and looked at all of the world's Alzheimer's risk factors. And they've identified 12 modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And that means these are the factors that we can change. These are the things we have the power to change. And the earlier you do that and set up these habits, the better. Um, one of these that's really important is hearing loss. Maybe not so much for the perimenopausal women, but maybe your husbands are getting some hearing loss and are reticent to getting hearing aids. But correcting hearing loss at midlife actually will reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Another really important um, factor is hypertension or high blood pressure. It's important to aggressively treat high blood pressure at midlife. It's actually not as important later because the, the brain might need like a slightly higher blood pressure to perfuse the blood flow that the brain needs. But it, between the ages of 45 and 65, it's really important to keep that systolic number, the 130, un, keep it under 130. Um, whether you need to take medication or you can do a diet or exercise, treat your blood pressure aggressively. Don't, don't be okay with a borderline high blood pressure for years on end that you maybe sometime will treat. This is one of the most important things that have come out of the Alzheimer's literature in the last few years. And the other thing like we talked about was limiting um, alcohol intake. Um, in the UK, they use units of alcohol and they want you to keep it under 21 units of alcohol per week. So a unit is not a drink. A unit, um, a drink like an eight ounce glass of wine can have about three units of alcohol in it. So the literature in terms of alcohol and brain health is really starting to come out more and more on, sure, a little bit of alcohol is good for your brain, but really just a small amount. Like for women, five ounces of red wine a day would be you know, an upper limit of normal. Um, and all the other data is coming back on, you know, cutting back on the alcohol intake, having alcohol-free days in your week, and really limiting it as much as possible. 
So if I had to put it all in one slide, this is what brain healthy food is. This is a bit of a review. Um, a low, brain healthy food has a low glycemic index. So it's low in sugar, high in fiber. It won't spike your blood sugar and therefore you, you won't have a resulting spike in your insulin levels as well. It's low in saturated fats. It's rich in mono and polyunsaturated fats, like you get from olive oil or avocado, which makes the food delicious and satisfying. It's packed with antioxidants. Those are those flavanols we talked about. It's plant rich. I would say the brain healthy diet is mostly 90% plant-based. I like to say plant rich because I think it sounds more delicious, but mostly plant-based. Um, and that's because plants are what are going to provide you with all that fiber, all those phytonutrients, and all those healthy fats as well. It's nutrient dense. You know, when you start looking at your diet through the lens of brain health, you realize that you don't want to have any, you don't want to eat any foods that don't have nutrients in them, like, you know, like all purpose white flour or refined carbohydrates or, you know, sugary drinks or things like that. They really don't have any nutrient value. You need to be cognizant of everything that you put in your body should be fairly nutrient dense. Not all the time, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect, I don't have a perfect diet, but I shoot for 90% of the time, I try to eat according to these guidelines. And it's also not a diet. Food should be enjoyable, food should be, should be um, something that you share with people. It's, it's a great joy in life. Um, I think being too obsessed with the food you eat is not good either. But the brain healthy diet never really leaves anything for, you know, to be um, desired. It's, it's, it's full of flavor. It's full of nutrients and you never feel like you're on a diet. So we promised you brownies, right? So we'll be sending you this recipe for tahini swirl brownies. And I just want to tell you why, why this is a brain healthy recipe. Um, I mean, they're brownies, right? That's why I call them brownie bites. Small portions are, are better than eating off, you know, a whole slab. Um, but the way I make a lot of my recipes more brain friendly or brain healthy, is I substitute olive oil for butter. Sometimes I bake with avocado oil too, or pecan oil. I really like those oils for their fatty acid profile. Um, but by doing that, I'm shifting the fat prof profile to more mono and polyunsaturated fats and less saturated fat like you would get in butter. I use butter sometimes, but I'm primarily baking with olive oil. Um, I try not to use any refined sugars in my baked goods. I do this by a combination of things. Sometimes I'll add applesauce, which also adds fiber. I'll add um, maple syrup or maybe dates or date puree, whole food sources of sugar to sweeten foods, which also provides fiber and nutrients as well. Instead of white flour, I like to bake with almond flour, hazelnut flour. Um, lots of the nut and seed flours are absolutely delicious in baked goods, and they also provide nutrient density, whereas white flour doesn't really give you anything like that. Um, natural cacao powder also has a lot of flavanols, especially 60% or greater cacao power. And then these are swirled with tahini because not only is tahini delicious, but tahini is made from sesame seeds, which provides so many nutrients and also healthy fats as well. So um, give this recipe a try. We'll send it along. Be careful not to overbake these, okay? And uh, keep an eye on them when they're in the oven. Um, I have a couple takeaways for you. One is the Brain Health Kitchen Guide to Cooking Oils. I'll also be sending you a one sheet tip sheet on brain health and also a, a shopping guide for, to you that you can um, clip off or print off and, and take to the grocery store with you with all my brain healthy foods on it. And I'm wrapping up. Uh, I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you all and please reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook or visit my website. I have a newsletter that goes out monthly. It's free of charge that includes recipes and tidbits on what's new in brain health. And as soon as the pandemic's over, my cooking school will be back in action. And maybe I can come to do a cooking class near you or you come to Jackson Hole where I live and we can cook together. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Finn. Thank you. So folks, at this time, we'd like to open it up to Q&A. Um, if you see on your screen, on the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A. So please feel free to type in your questions. Um, I see we have a question already. And this is for Dr. Ross. If you're forced into early menopause because of breast cancer, in other words, you had chemo and have to take uh, tamoxifen, 
Do you have any suggestions on how to deal with such horrible hot flashes that you leave you waking up from sleep, also sweaty to the point you have to change your clothes? You're, yeah, you're on mute, Dr. Ross. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and there are lots of things with diet, not to push this right back to Dr. Finn, but I think that's really very, very important. Um, and we do treat people that have had breast cancer five years out, but not when they're right in the beginning throes of it. So oftentimes, um, depending, we'll look at their hormones and depending on their levels, there are some natural supplements that you can use as well that can kind of dull some of these effects. And then the others that we use would be watching your diet carefully. So no alcohol, which hopefully if you've been through the cancer um, scare, it, you know we all try to avoid alcohol and change our food when we go through these things. And I think that's really important. Um, if you are estrogen, high in estrogen, which oftentimes if you're sort of in the middle range of age and you're getting ready to become perimenopausal or are and develop cancer, your estrogen will be high because progesterone is often the first hormone to decline. And so just by the fact that you don't have progesterone to offset it. And so there's some natural supplements you can use. Indo-3 carbonyl is one. These are all plant-based supplements. Um, DIM is another, which actually I've been using more and more recently because there's new literature that it helps with brain inflammation as well. Um, but those are some of the things that I would do to help curb those side effects. Thank you. Dr. Finn, do you have any thoughts about medical marijuana? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, I actually follow the literature on cannabis and Alzheimer's pretty closely, not so much the menopausal literature. Um, and it hasn't, the studies haven't really been the type of studies that I would quote and recommend to people in general. Um, you know, there, it's sort of all over the place. And I think it's going to take a while for the, the scientific literature to gel where I can come out one way or another and recommend it. Everyone's just trying their own things. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, for the most part, it's, it's not thought to be super harmful. Um, so that's a good thing to know. Okay. Dr. Ross, is it necessary to test for APOE4 if neither parent had Alzheimer's disease? I think that, you know, that depends. Um, we see plenty of people that are APOE3 threes um, that develop Alzheimer's. So um, I don't think it's absolutely essential. Um, I think that the truth of the matter is, if you want to do prevention for brain health, it's part sort of work. And having said that, I have plenty of people who know their parents have had it, and they're not sure if they were APOE4 positive or not, and they've chosen just to live as if they have it. So in other words, it's just adopting a brain healthy diet. It's doing the proper exercise regimen, working on your sleep, doing brain exercises, and having your blood evaluated to see if there's nutrients that you're lacking, fix them, optimize them. If you need hormonal optimization, do it. Now's the time, and then you can live for decades without some of these chronic illnesses. Okay, thank you. Dr. Finn, what are your thoughts on old style carbs, such as bread stuff, pasta stuff, gluten stuff? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I don't eat so much of it anymore. Um, you know, I come from a Sicilian American family and I used to teach classes on making homemade pasta. And I do really love that food. When I travel to Italy, I don't hold back. I really enjoy myself. But more and more now I'm making noodles out of zucchini instead of flour. Um, I, I don't think that gluten is really an issue unless you are allergic to gluten or have celiac disease, which is a small percentage of the population. So the gluten thing is sort of a red herring. It's like gluten free or gluten not. I mean, if, you're not, if it doesn't bother you, don't worry about it. What I want you to focus on is getting nutrient dense whole grains. And so that usually means avoiding refined carbs, white bread, 
things of that sort. But you can get really good ancient grain pasta now, um, as well as pasta made from spelt and chickpeas. It's very good. Um, and you can also, you know, fill your diet with things like forbidden rice is one of my favorite um, whole grains because it's a nutrient dense rice that is blue and black in color because it has anthocyanins, the same thing that makes blueberries healthy. Um, brown rice is also great. Um, you know, just make sure that when you're getting any of these carbs, make sure that they're high in fiber and nutrient dense. Okay. And we have time for one more question. Um, is there a blood test? I, I believe this is for Dr. Ross. Is there a blood test my doctor can run that checks for estrogen levels? I had uterine ablation six years ago, so no longer have periods and suspect I'm in perimenopause, but hard to, stay, hard to say for sure. So great question. The answer is yes. I do do blood tests on my patients often because it's easy. They can go to LabCorp or Quest and we put it on insurance. But having said that, it's not as accurate, okay? It just depends. There's some caveats. And so obviously she's had an ablation, so she's not probably having periods. And I do do that. There are better tests that if you're ever interested in your estrogen metabolism, you can do things like a Dutch test, which is urine and saliva. So they all work at the end of the day. Great, thank you. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, especially Dr. Ross and Dr. Fenn, and their much needed information they've provided. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Christiane Lee, uh, for assistance in providing this virtual presentation to you today. If you'd like to reach Dr. Ross at the Brain Health and Research Institute, please feel free to go to her website at www.brainhealthandresearch.com. If you'd like to contact Dr. Fenn, please go to her website at www.brainhealthkitchen.com. And for those of you who'd like to learn more about the Kensington, please feel free to call us at 914-390-0080, or please feel free to go to our website at www.thekensingtonwhiteplains.com. And folks, um, Dr. Fenn had actually mentioned this during her presentation, but as an added bonus, everyone who's joined us today will receive vital information to keep your brain and, and, and uh, body healthy, including that fudgy brownie recipe. So everyone, thanks again for joining us today. I hope you gleaned some really good information that you can use to keep your brain and body healthy at their optimal levels. Stay safe.